I don't know how go back and watch well. Them. I do, and I post them to YouTube as well, so I the world can watch them. <laughs> Not that anyone does watch them, but um, this is all part of the video now. Um, so um, the, uh, I guess I'll just start, because I don't really have any background to this paper. Um, a lot of times in actual conferences, I talk about where the paper comes from. But you're all in this class, so you know. Um, so the title of my paper is The Importance of Being Anxious, a Trivial Paper for Serious People. Oscar Wilde's play, The Importance of Being Earnest, demonstrates typically modernist ambivalence and anxiety about the loss of individual identity in a mass culture. As an aesthete, Wilde was centrally concerned with individualism, a performative individualism based on drawing attention to oneself through both fashion and literary style. One way in which Wilde constructed a performative identity for himself was through his famous wit, the delightfully turned phrases that Mark Wilde's writing is distinct from almost every other writer of his time or any other. And, and another way was through his attention to fashionable clothing, fashions which he had a hand in creating, at least according to Paul Fortunato's Wildean philosophy with a needle and thread, which we all read. Uh, indeed, as one of Wilde's characters, Lord Henry Wotton, the ideal aesthete with whom I would suggest Wilde identifies, says in the picture of Dorian Gray, there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. And I think this cleverly encapsulates Wilde's attitude toward his own public persona. And although importance is frequently written off by critics, as well as viewers or readers, as a farce, a term suggesting a lack of depth or serious social function, I argue that the play actually does reflect social concerns that pervade the work of other modernists, most of whom confront these anxieties in more serious and direct ways, though not necessarily in deeper ways. The play's often ignored subtitle, A Trivial Comedy for Serious People, which I've maintained in parodic form for the title of my paper, points to the tension within the play's larger project. I suggest that this play utilizes humor, farcical humor, uh, to explore contemporary anxieties about the loss of individual identities in a modern mass culture. Throughout the late 1800s and into the 1900s, English society was becoming increasingly democratic, at least if we take the imperfect measure of expanded voting rights as an indicator. For many artists and writers of the modernist period, arguably beginning in the 1870s with the Impressionists and holding sway as the dominant cultural mode through the 1960s, this increasing democratization was to be simultaneously celebrated and mourned. For instance, Wilde's contemporary and fellow Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw, was an outspoken socialist. But Virginia Woolf's novel, Mrs. Dalloway, grapples with the loss of identity in the fractured modernist social world. Wilde's play, I argue, explores these same concerns. The simultaneous desire for individual identity and anxiety about the threat to such an identity in the modern world. The importance of being earnest is, as any casual viewer or reader knows, a play about mistaken or obscured identities. Centrally, the name earnest functions as a sliding signifier, being adopted and discarded by characters to achieve their own short-term goals. We first encounter the use of earnest as an easily adoptable signifier in the first scene, when we learn that Jack Worthing uses the name when he comes to London. Jack explains that, in order to get up to town, I have, I have always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. Jack puts on the name of Ernest in town, in much the same way he dresses in the latest fashions to move comfortably in the upper social circles. Uh, Jack's movement between different social realms, town and country, thematically mirrors his movement between two different names or identities of Ernest and Jack. Throughout the early part of the first act, Jack speaks in binaries and contrasts. He says, when one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. And correspondingly, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country. These two binaries are connected, each linking Jack's fragmented identity, which is represented in both his social situations and his dual names. Jack's companion, Algernon Moncrief's initial reaction to this revelation is a skeptical one. <coughs> Sorry. 
he introduces into the play the idea that identity should be directly tied to personality, uh, particularly when that identity is earnest. After Jack denies being named Ernest, in an attempt to reclaim his lost cigarette case, Algy tells him, you look as if your name was Ernest. You're the most earnest looking person I've ever seen in my life. In the same speech, Algy also introduces the play's thematic concern with establishing identity through external documentation. Algy notes, it's perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. And I'll keep this as proof your name is Ernest if you ever attempt to deny it to me or to Gwendolyn or to anyone else. These two thematic concerns, the connection between name and essence, and the role of documents in establishing those identities dominates much of the play. Now the love interests of both Jack and Algy, Gwendolyn and Cecily respectively, each rely on the link between the name Ernest and a personality supposed to be tied to that name. First, Gwendolyn mentions this during the first act. She tells Jack, whom she still believes is named Ernest, my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. In one of the repetitions of which Wilde is so fond, Cecily uses almost the exact same phrasing in the second act when she meets Algy, who has come out to Jack and Cecily's country home using the name Ernest. In the repetition of these lines, not only is Wilde establishing the kind of witty humor that characterizes his style, he's also drawing attention to the intimate link between identity and essence, the play's concern that one's name or identity is linked to an essential truth of their nature. In other words, the name Ernest is linked to certain desirable qualities, and in a proto-postmodernist move, these qualities adhere to the name itself, the signifier, rather than to the person named, the signified. The other element of this proto-postmodern move that the importance of being Ernest makes is connecting identity identity to external documentation. Again, the identity does not adhere in the individual, the signified, but is determined by the existence of records, documents, and accounts of family heritage. Indeed, Jack's major conflict throughout the play is based on his lack of family connections. <coughs> when you're sick, presenting is not so smooth. Um, based on his lack of family connections. This is a problem developed in Act One. The issue is raised by Lady Bracknell, a member of the aristocracy who voices contemporary or slightly old-fashioned anxieties about the dangers of a democratized mass culture. Lady Bracknell first mentions mass cultural violence, the violence of revolutionary mobs, when she claims, fortunately in England at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and, and would probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. These concerns about violence attach themselves to Jack Worthing specifically when Lady Bracknell learns of his indeterminate origins. He confesses to her that, I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found in a handbag. This becomes the objection Lady Bracknell uses to deny Jack's suit for Gwendolyn's hand in marriage. She ties his origin to the danger of mob violence, declaring that, to be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. For Lady Bracknell, the mob violence of the French Revolution, or its reimagined English other in, Gro in Grosvenor Square, is tied to the loss of identity in an increasingly democratic culture. A contemporary rhetoric, particularly amongst the upper classes, commonly opposed any expansion of the franchise or other moves toward democracy following the French Revolution because violence became inextricably linked to mass or popular culture. This terror of the crowd arises because, as Elias Canetti points out in his study, Crowds and Power, within the crowd there is equality. For Canetti, this is generally a positive quality, leading to a kind of existential liberation from the anxieties that so often trouble the modern subject. Canetti argues that crowds are attractive because, in the crowd, the individual feels that he is transcending the limits of his own person. The distances are removed, which used to throw him back on himself and shut him in. With the lifting of these burdens of distance, he feels free. From the vantage point of 1973, Kennedy takes a much more liberal view of crowds and violence than Lady Bracknell does in Wilde's 1895 play. 
Of course, by the 1890s, evoking the French Revolution was rather outdated, which is part of Wilde's satire of Lady Bracknell as a conservative and rather stuffy aristocrat. Although this satirical presentation makes it difficult to view Lady Bracknell as anything but a joke, I think we must take her concerns seriously, because within, uh, within the sphere of the play, her cultural anxieties are presented as seriously as any other character's concerns. In other words, because no character is presented seriously, Lady Bracknell's worry carry as much concern as any other set of anxieties. The problem of Jack's lack of identity, or rather perhaps the ease with which he and other characters move between identities, is resolved at the end of the play, though the resolution is not entirely satisfying. The instability of identity is corrected by recourse to authorities that provide an external account. Initially, both Jack and Algie appeal to the church as an external authority capable of providing, or imposing, an identity. Gwendolyn and Cecily have each declared to their fiancés, Jack and Algie respectively, that their love is conditional on the men being named Ernest. And so both men sign up with Dr. Cheshable, the local clergyman, also a satiric figure, to be christened under the name Ernest. When Gwendolyn and Cecily discover that both Jack and Algy have been masquerading under the same name, they proclaim in unison, another of Wilde's peculiarly witty devices, your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier, that is all. And their suitors reply, also in unison, our Christian names, is that all? But we are going to be christened this afternoon. Once again, we see that the signifier of the name takes precedence over the signified body. Merely being marked by the church as earnest is enough to inspire absolute confidence, as Cecily claims that that name does. In the play's proto-postmodernist agenda, being properly named is of greater significance than for the individual so named to actually be worthy of absolute confidence. The ceremony of christening is imagined, at least in the play's satirical economy, to provide an adequate external reassurance of identity. This reliance on external forms of documentation to establish identity is further reinforced at the very end of the play, when Lady Bracknell has arrived and unraveled the mystery of Jack's origin in the handbag. It is discovered, or uncovered, or revealed, that Jack was left through an absurd set of circumstances by Miss Prism, who, was, uh, who had been his guardian, but at the time of the play is Cecily's governess. With this reveal, we learn that Jack is, as Lady Bracknell explains, the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently Algernon's older brother. Although Jack's familial heritage is established through this reveal, the question of Jack's first name remains in doubt. The first name is crucial for the play because as part of the, the play's ironic commentary, it is only the first name that matters, though the family name is important in establishing Jack's distinct and unique heritage as a member of the upper class a social sphere marked by its ability to trace its heritage and connection through several generations. But in importance's focus on surface is the first name, the individual signifier rather than the familial signifier, takes on primary focus. As with the christening, it is only by turning to an external authority that Jack's official first name can be established. Lady Bracknell recalls that Jack had been named after his father, but she could not remember the father's name. Because Jack's father was a general, Lady Bracknell notes that she has no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The familial memory is insufficient. Jack must go to the official military records published by the army in order to learn that he had originally been christened, in another moment of Wildean irony, Ernest. Now, throughout this paper, I've tried to suggest the ways in which the importance of being Ernest negotiates modernist concerns with the instability of identity in an increasingly democratic society. Wilde's play unsettles the notion of individual identity in a fragmented modernist culture scape. He plays with surfaces, signifiers rather than signifieds, to explore questions about what sources can productively form the basis for a solid identity and what kinds of identities must adhere to the subject. The play suggests some identities attached to the subject while others can exist more as free-floating signifiers, somewhat like clothing that can be put on for specific occasions. I have also contended that the cultural work Wilde is doing in this play cannot be ignored merely because the play is a farce. In this brief paper, I have begun to move, I hope, 
toward a revaluation of Wilde's farce as a serious work of modernist literature. Thank you. I'm going to record the Q&A session if that's cool. If with it's all right with, with everybody. Anyone object to that? If you object, we can turn it off, but you're fine. Are you not fine with that? Okay. Okay. So, it, it does end up on YouTube, then you're all there, kind of. Yes. Okay. But you're all warned. You may end up, you will end up on YouTube, unless you object. Who so. watch the Watchmen? <laughs> okay, that's clearly... Um, it's a uh, Alan Moore, Cicero said that. Yes. Oh. Um. All right. Questions, okay. comments, Sean, concerns? You should kickstart us. Sure. Yeah. So, wonderful presentation, you know. And the paper is so really good. I, I had difficulty on, on trying to find out some limitations. I had, I had difficulty. When okay. we talk about comments, normally we think of some drawbacks or something like that. So, what I really liked about this paper is your your big project reevaluating the whole text in a sense uh, recuperating the status of the text in the modernist corpus that's really great and if you can do that it would be it would be wonderful for the whole class you know that's that's the first thing and another very significant thing about this paper is your i know about you, your firm grasp of Butler's notion of identity as performance, although I don't know why you missed her name there. You know, that's, that's, that's very important. And uh, I also, an another very important point, which is related to your project of re-evaluating re the status of the text, is the way you deconstruct uh, the style, substance, nexus. Mm -hmm. What you say is, normally when the presentation is serious, uh, there is depth of thought. When presentation, the style is funny, the idea is not that serious, that's the common assumption. But you are saying that that's not true. The nexus between the style and substance should be deconstructed. Only then uh, this, this text can be, uh, the real import of the text can be brought into being. That's really important. I really appreciate that. And. Uh, what, what I liked about the, the strength of this paper is, is basically, for me, uh, the way you interpret how identity is formed. You know, that's, that's, that's wonderful. But where you fail, for me, you know, is you're, you're, when, when you interpret, okay, this is how identity is formed, everything, that's, that's wonderful. It's mm -hmm. lucidly presented, very solidly argued. But when you talk about this identity crisis as a um, modernist agenda, something related to democratization, I think you need to expand the paper to address that issue because this issue of democratization and identity crisis doesn't really... Uh, I was also... I, when I read this paper, is this how is this paper... Oh, oh, one question came to my mind time and again. How is this identity crisis that you are explaining different from the identity crisis that now nowadays we talk about, like identity crisis in Invisible Man or something like mm. that? It, is this identity crisis same or different with the existential crisis or so? What the, the point is? It's modernist anxiety or crisis related to identity crisis. Are these two things, do these two things go together? I, I suspect they don't go that, that well, which you are trying and it may be difficult to prove. That's how, how I feel. And what I also think is perhaps uh, you, you certainly give lots of emphasis on this uh, urban rural divide, mm -hmm. which, which is for me a very significant part of modernism. What I thought is perhaps instead of talking about um, another Irish dramatist, uh, uh, Bernard Shaw, yeah. or or with, um, with with Virginia Woolf, you you could have brought about uh, Chekhov's uh, 
or said, uh, you know, you, you have that divide there. Or you yeah. would have brought Howard's and the, the book we read. That mm. would be more relevant than, than uh, that, that's my feeling. Perhaps, okay. and, and, and another thing is, this, this is a serious question, because uh, in one of the assumptions of this paper is, you think that there is identity crisis in modernist mass culture. I think some substantial uh, authority is needed for that because I think there are there are expertise experts who, who are against that. For instance, uh, George Simmel. Uh, for him, there is no identity crisis in in, in metropolitan sphere. For him. Metropolitan sphere is is a, is, a, is, a, is a space where identity is possible. When you move from countryside and go to the city, um, your true, true, you understand that there is no true or something like yes. that. that. That is wonderfully done. Specialized in that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so perhaps these are some of my comments. You know, just um, I don't know. But okay. basically, the strength of the paper is the way you talk about um, the formation of the identity and bringing in deconstruction, postmodernism, structuralism. Butler, of course, uh, that's wonderful. And another, another, another thing I appreciate is how you could manage to use this class to use your interest in 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 modern uh, British drama. That's that's wonderful. I like that. And, and one, one, one comment is, you, you talk about um, this identity, mistaken identity kind of thing. Mistaken identity is also related, related to, you know that you are a kind of expert uh, with, with comedy of manners, um, the 18th century neoclassical. Yeah, uh, there, is, there is identity, uh, this mistaken identity, and that mistaken identity is not identity crisis. That's a different kind of thing. So if you address in two, four sentences, Something like that, perhaps your issue of identity crisis can be more meaningful. Mm -hmm. These are some of my thoughts. And and problem is, I did, I haven't gone through the through through the text you interpreted. Mm -hmm. That's why my comments might might be silly. You know, I'm serious about no, that. Um, no, I mean these are these are a good uh, sort of set of suggestions. Um, and I'm glad that I wrote, uh, sort of took notes uh, because you gave me a lot of good stuff. Um, some of the things that, that you're sort of asking about or gesturing toward, um, I'm already sort of working toward and sort of for space reasons, for uh, the limitations of a six and a half page paper. Um, I had to cut out some of the things. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, like the issue of uh, democratization that you raised, I'm working with a very specific uh, sort of explanation or theorization of democracy um, that comes out of Jacques Ranciere's Dicensis. Um, and basically the idea that Ranciere posits is that democracy is rule by those who are not in any way qualified to rule. Um, so in this way it seems to me that uh, democratization is a sort of movement from the qualified qualified rulers of the aristocracy of a monarchical period into a period when being a citizen qualified you to be a ruler of the nation. And I think for, I mean, Lady Bracknell is the big figure of this anxiety for me. Um, and she's a problematic figure partially because she's a satirical figure. But I think that her concerns sort of fit within a sort of larger canon of modernist anxieties. Um, think, like Howard's End is going to be a, a text that comes into this. Um, and I think uh, the sort of satirical way that Forster deals with Leonard Bast is in this same sort of vein of like the poor, the working class, and so on and so on are suddenly becoming part of the political process but there are these sort of concerns about how qualified they are and by what standard they could be qualified uh, to be rulers. Um, 
and incidentally, the Howard's End issue is going uh, is uh, implicit in the urban-rural divide as well. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in the Hegland essay that we read about the English country house as a sort of source of conservative identity, because the uh, Jack and Cecily's country home where the second and third acts of the play are set is actually called the manor house. Um, so it's very much within that sort of tradition that, that Hegland is evoking. Um, and then yes, of course, mistaken identity is a genre convention of comedy uh, and of the comedy of manners. Um, which is, the, of course, the genre that Wild is working in. But thank you. Those were those are good suggestions. Not the paper is good. Other suggestions other? from others who know the play and know the work. So um, the deconstructing reading is super smart, really, really strong, very, very well done. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the concept of sliding signifier is is extremely well put, very cogently argued. So that is that is very very strong. Um, I think uh, the part of uh, the argument which I liked was you're trying to equate the simultaneous threat to desire or identity with the uh, with the construction of identity happening at the same time. So the threat and, and that is almost like a you know a, a feeling of uh, sort of like a jouissance mm -hmm. happening at the same time, like pain and pleasure at the same time, right? So I like that aspect, yeah. particularly um, for a group like the Futurists right. who come shortly after this. Right, right. Yeah. The the larger question, and this is not this is not a comment or a critique. I had a, like a maybe a, maybe a clarification is that you talked of. Um, sort of official or uh, institutionalized signifying systems like religion, uh, military, being the larger structure through which the signifiers are at least trying to reach a resolution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Ernest's name get resolved by looking at military records, right? The christening of Ernest by the church gives them legitimacy, right? Um, yes. And you, you will probably address this in a longer paper. Um, what I want to understand is how are you looking at these resolutions? Are you looking them as problematic modernist uh, uh, strategies, or are you locating them as you put forward as a proto-postmodern move? Right, and I have a little bit of problem with the proto-postmodern move uh, I'm because not surprised. Yeah, uh, because for me, I look at modernism as a larger topos, right, as a space where uh, multiple debates are being theorized at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for me at this point of time, I would be concerned to use the word proto-postmodern because this could be, this is very modernist as a whole for me, right? So that is the, so that's, you know, if you understand, it's your theoretical frame point and mine, right? Which, yes. which differed at this point of time. Uh, um, and so that's that's the larger question I have for you. No, and that's, and that's an important question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think partially the the proto postmodernist term is my own sort of yeah. desire to it's, it's, read it's, it's, things as po as in some way related to yeah. postmodernism. Um, the play is definitely in a, a sort of modernist tradition, and so I don't sort of have a problem with mm -hmm. seeing it that way. Um, but in terms of your questions about sort of official signifying systems, I mean, I I think one of the things that really appeals to me about um, the farce or the comedy of manners as a genre is that it's hard to see even when the play sort of suggests that we've reached a resolution it's hard to sort of accept that resolution right so I think the uh, I mean the christening is very directly satirical sure. like that's uh, very much intended to be a sort of farcical element mm -hmm. um, because Dr. Cheshubal is such a, a farcical